Okay, hi everyone. We're going to go ahead um, and get started, given that we have an extraordinary uh, hour ahead of us and we have a professor who needs to rush to a flight <laughs> shortly thereafter due to the weather. Um, my name is Jane Huckabee. I direct the International Human Rights Clinic here at the Law School, and it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce Professor Amna Akbar, who will be presenting today as part of our Human Rights in Practice series on the topic Law and Social Movements, the turn to law reform and policy platforms in today's left. Um, Professor Akbar will particularly explore the ways in which today's left social movements have mobilised law reform projects, so including, for example, the Green New Deal and the Black Lives Matter um, movement, and to think through what the opportunities and the limits are of that turn to law reform um, amongst these movements. A couple of words about Professor Akbar. Professor Akbar is research and teaching focuses on social movements, critical theory and policing, race and inequality, and her scholarship is exploring the intersections between national security and criminal law and the potential of social movements to really transform our thinking about law, law enforcement, and law reform. She writes broadly for academic and popular audiences and outlets like the NYU Law Review, UCLA Law Review, and the Journal of Legal Education, Law and Political Economy, The Nation, Boston Review, and many others. In her teaching and lawyering work, she is deeply engaged with law and organizing in Ohio and around the country. Before joining Ohio State, the institution at which Professor Akbar uh, teaches, Professor Akbar taught at NYU Law School, and I that's where I know Professor Akbar from, having worked together for many years um, at NYU particularly focusing on issues around national security uh, and human rights. And Professor Akbar has also taught at CUNY Law School, also in New York. Uh, there's much more to say, but I just really want to get to your, to your lunchtime talk. We've been very eagerly anticipating Professor Akbar's visit uh, for quite a while now, trying to get on her schedule. Um, so without further discussion, I would like you to welcome Professor Akbar. Hi, everyone. So nice to be here, and I'm super grateful to Professor Huckerby and Professor Fujimura Fonzolo and to Balfour Smith for making my visit possible. So we are living in the era of Trump and the wall, the insurgence of white supremacy and right-wing movements. But we are also living in an age of protest and organizing and striking from the bottom and the left. Black Lives Matter and the indigenous Red Nation and Mehente and critical resistance. The nurses and the teachers, the tenants and the Amazon warehouse staff, the drivers at Uber and Lyft. And like the rebellions in Ferguson and Baltimore or the Standing Rock encampment, all of this recent social movement activity should be understood as a form of democratic insurgency that speaks to the shrunken domain of formal politics under capitalism and colonialism in the United States today. People are speaking back and loudly about how our political system is failing to provide meaningful opportunity to the vast majority of people. We are also living in the time of the squad, Bernie and Warren, the Democratic Socialists of America, and the Working Families Party and the Sunrise Movement and the Dream Defenders and more the era of Jacobin, Catalyst, and the Dig. And so slogans born of protest, like the 99%, Black Lives Matter, Abolish ICE, and Me Too, are remaking our political vocabulary and its grammar. In our movements and in national media and in local law reform campaigns across the country, we are debating the relationship between open borders and, ab open borders and abolition and socialism, between capitalism, colonialism, and enslavement between race, gender, and class, not whether but how to close, close jails like Rikers, whether a progressive prosecutor is a contradiction in terms, and whether capitalism's crises can be regulated away, or whether we need a new political, economic, and social system altogether. I want to talk about the exciting pot potential possibilities and pitfalls of law reform today. The left is growing in terms of its ideological purchase in the United States and its ability to mobilize people with its message. And law reform proposals and campaigns are central part of that toolkit right now. The vision for black lives, the Green New Deal, 
and the Red Deal, Chicago's Reparations Ordinance, Florida's Amendment 4, Ohio's Issue 1, rent control. Law reform is an important tool and one that should be approached strategically and with care. Contestation of legal institutions and obligations through things like bailouts, rent strikes, and organizing to close jails are also an important part of the picture that I'll touch on today. But before I do that, I want to make sure that we have some kind of shared understanding of the importance of social movements. Um, so I'm going to actually ask you to interact a little bit instead of just listen uh, passively. Um, and I'm going to ask you, I want you to take out uh, a computer or pencil and paper to jot down a few notes to yourself. Um, and the question I want you to reflect on, I'll give you about two minutes, um, is why are social movements important? Okay, so before I ask you what you came up with, I'm actually going to ask you to turn to one or two people most next to you. And so in groups of two or three, uh, talk about what you wrote about, reflected on, or what you think about what social movements are or why they're important. So take a couple minutes to chat with your neighbor. Well, that's part of what we're going to talk about. So do what you can to figure that out. I'll come talk to you. you now, what did you come up with? Why are social movements important? Anna, you can start with why you think social movements are really important. Hello, uh, I'm Anna. Uh, so I guess first before answering, my main question was, what was how is a social movement defined and whether or not it always needs to be progressive? Um, but regardless of that answer, one of the things that Professor Huckabee and I discussed was um, 
the democratic participation of a group with shared values, particularly if it's a marginalized community, mm -hmm. um, and how it can take you out of a loop of a specific type of thinking. So Professor Huckabee mentioned like abolish ICE isn't just reforming the current process, but completely reinventing mm -hmm. what exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really helpful. I mean, you've ident so I mean, briefly, we're not going to spend an extensive time def defining what a social movement is. It's contested territory, but certainly you have social movements of all forms of political persuasion from the right and the left. And so for a classic kind of right social movement, you might think about something like the Tea Party, for example. Um, but my interest and the focus of the talk today is on left social movements. And certainly you named, in a sense, two of the things that make social movements different than other forms of political participation. One being that it's not narrowly focused on a particular issue, but focused on kind of a broader um, set of questions. The second being that it's focused on disruption and not kind of um, moving in, all of the, in, in ways that are kind of the received traditional ways of moving politically. So disruptive tactics like, dis, like uh, direct action and protest are really important. And then the third thing you mentioned was this idea kind of of um, the scale of the social movement. So this idea of um, mass numbers of people participating is kind of the idealized form. For example, when we think of the civil rights movement, um, but they function at different levels and different scales. Okay, let's hear from someone else. What, why are social movements important? Yeah, in the back. Hi, I'm Sean. Hi, Sean. Um, I, I, I think they're a strong instrument of change, good mm -hmm. or bad. And um, see, I think, um, I think like framing theory, social movements frame how groups perceive reality. Mm -hmm. So the more people you can get in a social movement, right. the more you're changing that perception of reality. Right. So storytelling is a really important part of social movements. And the stories they tell have the power to disrupt uh, the way that um, we understand what's going on around us. And so it's certainly true that social movements do all sorts of work. And depending on who you are in the room and what your commitments are, whether or not you agree with or support a particular social movement will vary because social movements have all forms of ideological persuasion or commitments. But generally speaking, uh, when you look at the history of uh, the United States or around the world, social movements have been fundamentally important for progressive social change. And so central to today's left insurgency is the underlying goal to build an ever-growing mass movement of ordinary people. And of course, we're nowhere near that. And for that mass movement to transform the society altogether, beyond capitalism and colonialism, towards a different relationship between the state, the land, and our labor, each other, and other living beings. For the last several years, I have been particularly focused on racial justice movements taking on the carceral state and I'm particularly interested in how left movements and organizers are art articulating historically grounded structural critiques about the United States. And at the same time, they're experimenting with the limits and potential of transformation through and against law. There's a long history of debate on the possibility and limits of law reform to transform the fundamental characteristics of our prevailing political order. And while no one reform can usher in transformation, Bottom-up law reforms of the sort these movements are experimenting with can work to build power, expand democratic domains, and demonstrate the potential for alternate political, economic, and social arrangements. So today's left law reform projects are campaigning for reforms that aim to make it harder for the current order to reproduce itself at the same time that they attempt to gesture at new possibilities, so kind of the disruption theme that Anna, Anna, Anna raised. Given reasonable concerns about reform and retrenchment or co-optation, the answers to these questions of how you kind of create a transformative law reform are always uncertain. But the orientation of these movements towards structural critique and transformation, rather than the typical kind of lawyerly fixation on technocratic failure and fix, changes the quality and the stakes of the questions we are asking. It re-injects law and our law reform projects with transformational potential in ways that all of us who are committed with substantive equality should care about. So this talk, I hope, will enrich and challenge your thinking about the work of law and law reform in the world. And I invite you in to join me in thinking through these complex problems. As you listen, I hope you'll take down some notes, jot down some questions and curiosities, and at the end, we'll have some time to kind of discuss those together. So the centrality of law reform projects today reflects the failures of 20th century left revolutionary politics 
and a recognition of the immensity of US military and police power that rose up in part to crush movements here and around the world. Today's left is not mired in debates over reform versus revolution. Instead, the left is focused on reforms and experiments that could transform our politics and, as I said, our relationships to each other and the land around us. These law reform proposals are significant for a number of reasons, but they also have limits. We should be careful to use them as a way to build power and expand the size of our multiracial movements, never and to never confuse the reforms we are pushing for as the ultimate end goal. One of the law's central mythologies is that law comes before politics, that it is neutral and apolitical. But law in itself is a way to neutralize distributional conflict and struggle. And that is part of what insulates law from challenge. Law becomes status quo with a horizon beyond, beyond sight. Sure, there may be some problems, but the law bends towards justice, we are told, apparently of its own benevolent volition. But the left's law reform proposals denaturalize law as before politics, and they show law to be a terrain of struggle and a tool. They point to law as a central site for contesting, polarizing, and reimagining our democratic order in ways that stand in stark contrast to the prevailing liberal legal approach to social change focused on courts, test cases, and individual plaintiffs. Movements today are using law as a tool for organizing. Recall the Sunrise Movement's occupation of Pelosi's office or the videotaped encounter with Senator Feinstein as part of their push for the Green New Deal. This protest politics injected with the power of law and the power of law injected with protest politics. And in this way, radical law reform proposals make clear that law is a realm of politics, that it is not fixed, neutral, naturally good, or beyond contestation. It is a terrain and a tool of struggle. Today's left law reform projects and the policy platforms in particular re-narrate the crises of our day as fundamental, historical, structural, and contingent. The movement for Black Lives, for example, took the question of police violence, which was the presumed focus of Black Lives Matter, Ferguson and Baltimore, and instead wrote an expansive visioning document in the Vision for Black Lives, their policy platform. They situated their critique in Black history and intellectual traditions and an imagination of alternate futures and Black freedom movements. The vision did not call for indictments of police violence or better training or supervision for police. The vision called instead for an end to the war on black people, pointing the finger at a broad range of institutions, typically narrated in popular and academic discourse as distinct, for example, the state and market, as with a long history and the responsibility for which rests with many institutions. It calls for divestment from police and prisons and investment in healthcare, housing, jobs, and schools. And then the Green New Deal takes the question of looming environmental disaster and connects it to labor and infrastructure. The indigenous Red Deal, authored by the Red Nation, reminds us that the struggle for the environment and the land must be won against capitalism and colonialism. It explicitly uses the framework of non-reformist reforms, which is a term to encapsulate reforms that don't tweak or ameliorate the current order, those that aim to make it harder for the current political, economic, social order to re reproduce itself and gesture towards new possibilities. Non-reformist reforms aim to expand the space for self-determination, reconstitute democratic domains, and demonstrate the potential for alternative orders. And they aim to build power, remake our imaginations, tell new stories, and shift our discourse to inspire people to fight for meaningful change. Significantly, today's left movements are intersectional, intersectional in, in their conceptions of the crises that face us. There are no discrete issues. Our movements are telling radical stories, denaturalizing the status quo, and reconceiving the crisis of US politics <laughs> at a grand scale. These interlinked narratives create the grounds for multiracial mass movements. Importantly, these are documents, these policy platforms, designed for organizing and come out of organizing and protest. The Green New Deal, as a resolution rather than a bill, seems a classic organizing tool to polarize, to draw the land in, line in the sand, and force people to pick a side. The vision for Black Lives included under its six large templates and suggestions for federal, state, and local action based on ongoing campaigns.
In Vest Divest, for example, the call to divest from prisons and police and invest in housing, education, and health has been taken up by local organizing campaigns around the country. These policy proposals are a plain bid for power, many of them for state power. And in narrating the crisis in scales deep and broad, reaching back and rooting in histories of enslavement and colonialism and radical new futures, you create a sense of urgency and possibility. And at the same time, the history of the left is back alive. So the Democratic Socialists of America is talking about socialist and communist history in the United States. The movement for black lives and Red Nation platforms reflect in various ways the history of the Black Panthers, the Young Lords, and the American Indian Movement. These lower form tools are a way, at the same time, to gesture at possibility and to point back to past freedom struggles that we have inherited and can learn from. And they also give a thing for allies and legislatures at the local, state, and federal level to run with as a way for us to hold them accountable. They give us a reason, something concrete, to build our power and fight at the ballot box at the same time that the movements use more contestation-oriented means. So let me take a few minutes now to point to some more localized law reform campaigns around the country um, that are a little bit different than the policy platforms. Recently, I've done a deep dive into abolitionist campaigns around the country, so campaigns that are fighting for reforms that are rooted in an idea that we should be fighting for a vision uh, of a police and prison-free society. So in Chicago, there was a successful reparations campaign for the two-decade-long torture program controlled by John Birch, a former police commander in the Chicago Police Department. After failed efforts to indict Burge, a reparations package was drafted by organizers and lawyers and ultimately legislated to City Hall. It included $5.5 million for survivors, free junior college tuition and counseling services, a public memorial, and inclusion of the history of police violence to the public school curriculum. The organizers framed the campaign as an exercise of recovering a broader imagination around police accountability beyond indictments, and committed to acknowledgement, repair, and transformation. There have also been a number of campaigns around the country against building jail infrastructure. In New York, for example, No New Jails and Critical Resistance vocally opposed the city's plan to close Rikers and build four new jails. And a central concern was the $8 to $11 billion price tag for building the four new jails. But the organizations also emphasized that an alternate course the city could take was to have the NYPD arrest fewer people. And at the same time, there was, an, there was another organization, Just Leadership USA, that um, celebrated the city's decision as one that would improve jail conditions and substantially decrease jail bed space. And both sets of organizations underline the ongoing need to fight for alternative investments in directly impacted communities, so a form of that invest-divest framework I was talking about before. The Rikers battle reflects both the momentum and the limits of radical law reform campaigns now, and in particular those rooted in abolitionist imaginations. Right now, Rikers is closing, four new jails are opening, bed, bed space is shrinking, Critical resistance in no new jails turned a fight to close a particularly infamous jail into a fight about the very violence of jail infrastructure and the choice to invest in jails and police rather than community infrastructure. They pointed to the scale of policing that feeds jails and the alternate modes of response to which cities could be responding to the same social problems. The debate was waged on abolitionist territory, thinking about the contradictions between policing, incarceration, and people's needs, and conceiving of the scale of interlinked infrastructure as a central problem to take on. Or consider No Cop Academy, a defensive campaign against Chicago's plan to acquire land and allocate $95 million for a second police training facility. No Cop Academy troubled the idea that police spending reduces rather than causes harm. After canvassing local residents, the campaign argued that investing in things like mental health care, education, jobs, and housing was, were the actual kinds of investments that can actually, quote, cut back on the trauma, poverty, and pain that often leads to violence in our communities. The campaign posed the question, if there's $95 million for a cop academy, why isn't there $95 million for schools in our community or a Laquan McDonald wellness, wellness space? The campaign changed the conversation from one about police reform 
for an infamously corrupt police department to one about structural realities of divestment from black communities in Chicago's west side. And that the campaign was defensive about appropriations and building infrastructure, focused on loosening the connection in people's imaginations between policing and safety, makes it no less a law reform campaign. Fights are being waged across the country against jail and police expansion and investments. Many of them are defensive. Many are about infrastructure. These campaigns expand our notions of what progressive law reform is about, historically focused on questions of right, rights. They point to the materiality of law and the life of legal institutions through their resources and their power. They remind us that if we're interested in building a more equal world, we can't wage our battle simply on the terrain of rights or litigation. We must consider the ideological and material infrastructure of our social arrangements, including at the local level, and consider how we might reshape them. As exciting as it is that the left has moved beyond critique to law reform, it's a tool that's laced with risks, and so we should tread carefully. Law reform and policy is easily a continuation of liberal politics and legalism. It can be expert-driven, elite-centered, foundation-guided, an easy extension of the work of nonprofits. And whereas grass tops nonprofits are an improvement over the, those that claim no connection to grassroots, we can't delude ourselves about the problems of nonprofit or grass tops work that's done without engaging ordinary people focused on building movements. The movements we are trying to build can't be staffed or led by nonprofits. Organizing is not deep in many parts of the country, and law reform proposals can be a distraction from that primary work. Law reform proposals shouldn't displace organizing or protest and direct action, all of which are important tools for these movements to gain, to gain scale and power of the sort that they need to effectuate the changes that they're hoping to build for. The only way to rise to the challenge is to always make sure that the movements are focused on building their scale and their power. That we stay focused on building movements of ordinary people, black and brown, poor and working class, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated, LGBTQ and non-binary, and that we're serious about what is the world that we're trying to fight for. So let me start, let me end around where we started, the question of why social movements are so important and how an understanding of social movements as being central to social change might change the way that you think about your work as a lawyer or the importance or limits of law reform. To effectuate social change, you have to have an analysis of where we are today. You have to have a vision of the world that you're trying to fight for and a theory about how we get from here to there. And I would encourage you, to the extent that you're interested in questions of social change, that you engage in kind of developing an account of all three of these questions. Law school gives you a number of answers to these questions, and a theory of social change that focused on courts and elites. And I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A, to the extent that it's interesting. Um, movement lawyering gives you an alternate way to think about these questions, rooting you in how you can use your legal skills, training, relationships, to build mass movements of ordinary people, to redistribute resources and reconstitute society. And I know I didn't talk a lot about movement lawyering. I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But these law reform proposals kind of represent a lot of the questions and importance of how law and movements can work together to build power. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it back to you again, for, and I'm going to ask you to do a few things before we try to engage in a conversation rather than a typical kind of hierarchical Q&A. Um, so what I would like to ask you to do again is to just take a minute to jot down a few notes about what resonated with what I said, um, where did you get stuck or disagree, what questions do you have, what feels important to talk about, look into, study, question, and so on. So take a minute or two. Uh, to write a few things down to, for yourself. <clears throat> 
Okay, now again, I'm going to ask you to do what we did last time. So turn to one or two people near you and talk for a couple of minutes about kind of what came up for you, what you wrote, jotted, jotted down notes or questions or hesitations about. <laughs> You have about two minutes left. Thank you for participating in that way. Let's hear from a handful of groups. What did you talk about? What came up for you as an individual in your group? What did you talk about in terms of comments, questions, curiosities, objections? Yeah, in the back. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, 
Mm -hmm. And so what's been a tension for me is that on the one hand, we do want this broad structural change and we want a more excellent society to exist in the field. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, like I don't know how to do participatory storm surge modeling, right? Like there are some things Participatory that, what? Storm surge modeling, like predicting when a storm hits, what level of inundation is going to occur as a result. Mm -hmm. And so for me, there's this tension of requiring a lot of hard expertise in science to tell us some of these boundary questions, while also wanting to engage in that kind of envisioning of a new society um, that I think is, is within that Green New Deal. Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate that because you're teeing up um, kind of two things that are really important. One is the importance of these mo movements, including the ones that are oriented both towards protest politics and law reform to continue to be focused on what they're doing, right? Which is disruption and pushing uh, law reform proposals um, and the need to kind of grow the scope and the scale of those movements in terms of more people uh, joining them. And at the same time, um, you're raising the question of how should experts or elites or lawyers, right? Participate in those movements. What is our role? Um, and one of the things that's really profoundly important about social movements today is they teach us the way that everyday people have an expertise about the crises that face them all of the time in ways that people who are locked into expert discourse or expert in elite institutions sometimes have a hard time seeing or articulating. Over the last few decades, there hasn't been a lot of space to kind of engage and push in that way. Um, and so on the one hand, movements like the Sunrise Movement do give power, space, and discourse to experts, for example, who are committed to climate justice to move in more expansive and bold ways because you are kind of having what in the social movements literature is called a flank effect, right? So you're kind of pushing the, you're expanding the terrain of the debate. Um, and at the same time, you hope, and this is one of the things, or I hope, um, that experts, lawyers, and elites find ways to join these movements without taking them over, right? To, to join as a way to offer expertise and tools, whether it's scientific or legal, um, while preserving kind of the horizontal mass politics in a sense that these movements represent as opposed to kind of traditional hierarchical forms of social organization. All right, let's hear from another group. Yeah, in the back. In the red turtleneck. Um, I, yeah, I was kind of wondering what you just said made me think about kind of maybe the ways that lawyers, people trained in the law can participate in maybe less traditional ways in, in these movements. But I'm thinking in terms of like practicing the law, how does one kind of be a part of movement lawyering in an era where like the official organs of the law are kind of dominated by reactionary forces? I mean, how do you deal with that? tension and is there a way to kind of make it work in that environment? Like I'm, I'm just kind of wondering about how do you deal with the existing framework when it's maybe opposed to what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is uh, a great question. So one thing that I find useful to always keep in mind um, is that for lawyers, we can always do both defensive work um, and offensive work, right? And so when you think about defensive work, what, well, when I think about defensive work, what I'm talking about is kind of the traditional kind of legal services, public defender kind of work, right? Um, or even kind of civil rights impact litigation of that sort, in the sense that we know that the law, whether we're talking about, um, you know, the formal criminal legal process or the deportation machinery or eviction court, right? So across kind of the spectrum of different domains of law, that the law is used as a tool to uh, oppress and facilitate inequality and dispossession in different ways, right? And there are um, tens of thousands, more than that, of people every day who are being impacted in really brutal ways by uh, that kind of work of law. And so lawyers can do really important defensive work in solidarity with people and for and with people that are being negatively impacted by the law in that way. And that defensive mode of lawyering is really important. And it's what most people who kind of go into public interest or social justice lawyering do. Um, the piece that we have been missing, I think, for many years is to have kind of a bold vision of what the affirmative work can look like. 
Um, and one of the, the, you know, the kind of key important thing for me with what these movements are doing is that they're providing a vision, right, an expansive, bold vision where the horizon is far, far away as a way for us to then to reconceptualize what the affirmative work can look like and stay grounded um, in the political terrain of the day. And so one of the reasons why these law reform campaigns are so exciting and interesting to me is because um, the conventional way of thinking about law reform is focused on, I mean, in law, is focused on litigation, right? And it's focused even on these kind of more, what I'm characterizing as defensive lawyering work. Um, and these movements are pointing to a different way to think about how you can use law, how you can be a lawyer in service of social change. That's not simply about the defensive work. Um, it's not simply about the courts or filing lawsuits, but it's thinking more broadly about the tools that lawyers and law provide. Um, and then in terms of like the other question you were raising about how lawyers can show up for movements more broadly, I mean, my number one advice, which um, to law students and people in general, um, is just, just join movement organizations. Like this person over here who said he's, you were part of the Sunrise Movement, um, I think if you're not already going to meetings of a local organization that's doing, whether it's national organizing or local organizing, it's also important. For me, the most meaningful transformation in my lawyering work has been from starting to attend and participate in social movement activity at the local and national level, to really listen and think and not want to kind of go immediately into what I think is a common and understandable lawyerly instinct to immediately want to do something that's familiar and that we know how to do to be helpful but instead to take some time to see what is happening in these movements, how might your skills, training, and relationships support them in reaching their goals, and then building relationships with people of trust so that you can then experiment with them in trying out these different tactics and in building these movements to scale. Okay, let's hear from another group. Yep, in the back. So when when movements experience uh, challenges that halt their momentum, yes. whether it's like, you know, sometimes movements come, become prisoners of their own success with divisions, how can uh, this kind of impact lawyering help continue that momentum? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's complicated. Uh, I think to the extent that lawyers have some skills in conflict resolution, um, in my own experience, that can be useful um, to be someone that, in a sense, doesn't get too involved in the intra-conflict and trying to find ways to use whatever our training is or your experiences as a lawyer to do that kind of conflict resolution to try to facilitate space for debate and dialogue, but also moving on and not, not allowing the thing to fraction. But that's, of course, like many of the things I'm saying are harder are easier to say than to do, but to kind of have that framework, I think, in terms of reimagining what we're doing and why we're doing it, I think is really important. All right, other thoughts? Can I invite the people in my group to? Yeah, Anna, sure. who has got the microphone, and our colleague here, and I can also add yeah. something. Anna, do you want to reflect on some of the things we talked about? Uh, so one of the last things that we mentioned was uh, the involvement of private actors. And so the relationship between the state, uh, social movement, and private actors and how uh, social uh, movers, I guess, can create change to protect themselves and their rights. Okay, if I can add, add on to that, we were talking through um, some of the tools of by which the state interacts with social movements, including like, through repression. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we're very familiar in the more traditional NGO landscape of the toolkit of the government when it comes to circumscribing mm -hmm. the power of NGOs, but they tend to rely on the fact that NGOs, as you mentioned, you know, have more formal structures, they require registration, there is a whole bunch of measures that states can take with regard to NGOs that reflect their composition. How does repression and state engagement look like um, in regard to social movements? Did you want to add? Did you want to add something? No. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I mean, repression creates the everyday landscape of <coughs> in which these social movements are acting in ways that are both visible and invisible, mm -hmm. right? So you can mm -hmm. even think of 
um, you know, just the, the scale and scope of the carceral state, the prisons and police and the deportation mm -hmm. regime um, as ways that shape the ability of people to engage in protest, right? So one of the things that I've learned that's been uh, really profound, and if I had more time, might tell you a story about, um, you know, was kind of providing legal support for people who were protesting and doing direct action in Ohio um, and having conversations with a number of uh, young people from directly impacted communities about their concerns about participating in protests given that they already had minor criminal records, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we know that the state targets uh, black and brown people, people from poor communities uh, with policing. And so that in itself makes it harder for pe directly impacted communities to participate in protests because the risk of the concept, the risk of arrest and the consequences mm -hmm. from that arrest are going to be far greater for people who have already had interactions with the system. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, of course, you can look at the history of the civil rights movement, the black power movement, the anti-war movement, mm -hmm. um, and learn from the history of COINTELPRO and the deep forms of repression, surveillance, and in infiltration um, that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s the government was doing uh, to destroy those movements. And of course, we know when we look, for example, at um, the vast surveillance infrastructure that's come up after 9-11, targeted at Muslims initially, but used more expansively against uh, both communities of color and different forms of dissident uh, communities, that that kind of infrastructure continues to kind of shape the landscape mm -hmm. in ways that are, again, like easy to see and difficult to know how to operate because mm -hmm. it seems so ever-present given the way that we're all plugged into our phones and there are cameras everywhere now and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So I think it's a looming problem with no, it's just ever present, basically. Yeah. Um, is, this, is this okay? Yeah. Uh, we've been asked to use the microphone, so if you don't mind just waiting for a moment. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, we talked about, uh, just to put simply, is what's the role of pluralism in movement lawyering? Um, and you can think of a lot of examples of two social movements having irreconcilable views about justice and freedom. Yeah. Right. And, and um, what, what are your thoughts on, on how to address that? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I didn't mean to, I'm always kind of interested in synergies, so I kind of told a story about how these movements are telling synergistic stories, and I think that is true in a way. But of course, these movements, I mean, even the example I provided of Rikers, where you have kind of two sets of organizations that are both kind of identifying with being abolitionists, but one is very against the city's plan and one is for it, kind of shows how within movement groups um, and community-based organizations, of course, there's all sorts of ideological difference or difference um, on the strategy that's acceptable and so on and so forth. Um, and so the questions are similar in a sense to what I was saying to the person in the back um, in the sense that on the one hand, to the extent that groups are have an ideological kind of difference with which you are comfortable and celebrating of in a way, you could I could certainly imagine a situation, and I've certainly done this myself, where you're kind of providing movement lawyering support to the whole range of organizations, as long as you're, I think, transparent and above board about it. I don't see any issue with that. And on the other hand, when you do movement lawyering work, like when you do any form of lawyering work, you are making decisions about how to lend your resources, skills, and relationships to particular forms of work or particular kinds of people or, certain, or you know, certain kinds of discourse and so on and so forth. So those questions are ever present in movement lawyering, but I don't actually think it's that different than other forms of lawyering. It's just that in the kind of more typical terrain of lawyering decisions, that framework is one that I think by and large within the legal profession we obscure. Mm -hmm. um, and it's some, but it's something that we should talk about. Other comments, questions, hesitations, reflections? Yeah. Um, our group kind of talked about the myth of law not or being for justice and fairness. And we're wondering how far we can push that in a sense, especially if the language that these social movements are using are based on law and um, the way we're trying to change the system is also through law. So like, how far can we push this notion that the law is not for justice and fairness and still use it for justice and fairness? Right, that's a great question. Um, so I guess there's a couple of things. One is that I think a key distinction between 
I would say, mainstream kind of legal ideology and what these movements are saying and doing is um, this distinction between whether or not the law in itself as it stands is a form, is generally fair and just with some minor problems on the edges as opposed to, in a sense, whether or not it's fundamentally corrupt, right? So that's a kind of different frame. And then the second kind of distinction that's important or has been really important to me in shifting my thinking is that um, the way that many lawyers think about justice um, is all, and this is actually kind of a complex, let me see if I can get it. It's like um, the way that many lawyers think of justice is that the end goal is to get the laws right, okay? And what these movements are doing is that they're, even, they're using law as a tool to try to build, to try to shift power, to expand kind of the realm of democracy and to build a more just society. And so the end goal is not law per se, law is a tool to try to kind of build that other society. And I think that shift um, is really important. I mean, I should say, and I'll only say a little bit about this right now, that in some of these movements, for example, in the more abolitionist kind of oriented movements, there are also strong veins of anarchist kind of impulses. And so in some of these movements, they might even take objection to the fact that I'm characterizing their work as law reform, because they are largely kind of contesting the violence of law as fundamental, as opposed to particular to the way that it's kind of manifesting today. Um, and so to that extent, I think it's a more uh, fundamental challenge that maybe requires a little bit more thinking. Uh, but most of what I'm kind of studying and focused on are these movements that are trying to build a different kind of state, so are less kind of anarchic in nature. Can I ask you a question which has besieged our country, Al Hujara? Okay. Um, and you know, it's the capital of social movements. Right. How do you insulate the primary objectives of the social movement from its funding aspects? You often find overarching yeah. funders. Right. In this particular case, many would be from the US mm -hmm. and would have a world view. Mm -hmm. How do you insulate the social movement from the inevitable impact of their life life, their funding? Um. I'm not sure, so I guess I'm not sure how you can, and I think you are identifying a really important um, question, both in terms of US-based social movements that are funded by philanthropy, and as kind of movements get, um, and movement organizations become darlings of a certain sort, more money gets channeled their way, and that creates different kinds of decision trees about what to focus on and why in ways that can co-opt, as you say, the fundamental goals. Um, I think that's part of why a lot of, um, well, maybe not a lot, a significant number of today's social movement organizations, I think, are trying to develop models where they're funded through membership, right? So they're not taking um, or trying to minimize the funding that they're taking from large foundations um, and trying to build models where they're fundraising from the base or uh, in some kind of more grassroots way. But of course, that's very difficult to do in a sustainable and meaningful way. Um, but I would love to talk to you more about your thoughts about that maybe after the talk, um, because I think it's a really hard question um, that does very much shape uh, the fights that these movements are having, especially once they become gain some purchase in the popular consciousness. Professor Miller. Uh, so I'll just talk loud. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess in my work, <laughs> my method of trying to kind of expand beyond this is to recover through studying contemporary social movements the larger imagination of these movements, that these movements were not focused simply on, for example, the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act, but many elements of these movements, like we see in the movements today, are thinking not about particular kinds of reforms as the end goal, but the reforms as a tool to build more structural change. But of course, because of the deep role of repression and state surveillance and infiltration and very active attempts that we can see more clearly now when it comes to the 60s and 70s by the state to crush these movements, it becomes very easy to co-opt and kind of entrench kind of the energy of these movements um, in a way that crushes their transformational potential. Um, and so that is a big reason why I think one of the, um, it's one of the big reasons why law reform, um, and I didn't spend as much time kind of talking about the pitfalls, it's one of the main kind of problems uh, with pursuing law reform as a primary tool because if you do that without staying focused on building the scale of the movements um, so that they can uh, try to withstand state repression, uh, prosecution, um, and so on and so forth, then they won't survive and be able to continue to fight for another day. You look unsatisfied. I don't understand. I'm not talking about Mm -hmm. Talking about, we've got a, we've got a teleology about uh -huh. we have an end state that we're imagining. Right. Right. That end state needs to be firmed up in some way, and I don't know what your theory of that is. It could be law. It could be we just change norms. It could be something else. It's all of those things. It's all of those. Okay. Yes. It's all of those things. Any final comments or questions for Professor Akbar? Anyone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet that would like to share? Any of my clinical colleagues that I'm going <laughs> to look towards? Yes, lady here. So our group talked mainly about, and this will be kind of just a point that I'd love to hear your reflection on, the tension as lawyers between serving those defensive person to person immediate yeah. symptomatic needs mm -hmm. and kind of refusing to serve those needs as a way to gain leverage with other lawyers to kind of maybe push for more systemic changes. Mm -hmm. That's something that sounds like all three of us are wondering how one um, rationalizes or works mm -hmm. through. Maybe both are equally valid and you just pick one. Okay, mm -hmm. let me try to reorient your question a little bit. So I would encourage you rather than to think about, I think trying to figure out how to move with or against or et cetera with other lawyers is really important. But I think the central question in a sense is if you care about social movements and if you're interested in movement lawyering is how to move in relation to movements. Um, and so one of the, the really rich opportunities, I think, um, f um, that hasn't been sufficiently tapped for lawyers to work with social movements is this. Remember briefly at the end when I was talking about limits and pitfalls, I mentioned that organizing around the country in many places is not very deep, right? Um, and so um, we don't have a lot of mass organizations in the country that are functioning and organizing um, in any like super significant scale. A lot of the movements today are deeply kind of interested um, in mass incarceration, in deportation, in evictions, right? Because gentrification is also a big issue for movements today. And as we know, all of those kinds of, I mean, in particular, when it comes to incarceration and eviction, those are um, issues where legal services and legal aid lawyers are very importantly engaged, right? So you're working with a lot of uh, individual clients in eviction proceedings or being prosecuted for crimes and so on and so forth. And so I think there's a real opportunity for lawyers who are working in legal aid and legal services organizations to try to find ways to collaborate with local organizations that are trying to do base building in directly impacted communities and try to create some connections 
between what's happening in the courthouses and the people coming through and the local movement organizations. And so that's how I would kind of try to think about that. Um, but I'm happy to talk about it with you in more detail after the talk. And with that, we have come to the conclusion um, of our talk. Thank you again, Professor Akbar. Thank for you. Thank you.